today, um, we'd, um, today in the coming one or two lectures, we will, we will focus on something that's um, of importance to uh, what follows in the course. Namely, um, we'll see that the uh, properties Properties of steel are being important. Uh, properties of steel are um, the mechanical properties, and um, we'll um, we we want to um, in lecture now today focus on um, where do these properties come from? What you know? What do we talk about when we talk about mechanical properties? And then in uh, the lecture that will follow, we'll see how we change these mechanical properties, and we'll mainly focus on uh, strength of steel hmm? and how we, we control the strength of steel. Okay, so let's uh, start with uh, beginning. We'll say, again, uh, the course is, is not a course on mechanical metallurgy. We'll just basically review uh, quickly but in depth uh, some ideas about elastic and plastic behavior. Um, elastic behavior and, and plastic deformation of uh, iron and steels, and uh, underscore the role of crystal plasticity in mechanical behavior of steel products. We'll, we'll see one of the things we, um, it's really hard to avoid talking about uh, when we're talking about plasticity, plastic deformation, is dislocation mechanisms. Um, and we'll see that um, these dislocation mechanisms are different in ferrite and austenite, right? and that this has an impact on not only uh, the difference in uh, mechanical properties between ferritic steels and austenitic steels, but also in the way these, these steels uh, may uh, be processed. And then we'll also see a point that's of uh, great importance, is the fact that crystallographic texture uh, has an impact on the properties. Um, Right, so let's start with um, elastic properties of iron. Start at the beginning means that uh, we have, if we look at an iron cubic BCC iron in a uh, single crystal, we have a relation between stresses, uh, normal stresses and shear stresses, and strains, normal strains and shear strains, um, and that this uh, relation is uh, expressed in this matrix forms that is known as generalized Hooke's law, which basically says sigma is modulus times the strain. And that's the matrix notation. And in this um, uh, single crystal material, we uh, this modulus is now a matrix, a matrix which has one, two, and three uh, constants, which define the elastic properties of BCC iron, uh, but also FCC iron, except that for FCC and BCC iron, these constants are different. These values are relatively well known. Here I give in uh, this table uh, some of these um, C values hmm, uh, for alpha iron. Uh, see here values, is they're close but not exactly the same and there is some variation depending on uh, what people have used, purity of the single crystals, etc. That, that were used for the test. You can also express the uh, in the previous uh, Hooke's law, the strain as a function of uh, stress, and in that case, the pr these C parameters are replaced by these S parameters. Hmm? Okay. These um, parameters, C parameters, yes, uh, how are they related to the uh, properties as we know them for steels? Well, very simply, um, if you want to compute the elastic modulus of 
a single crystal of iron in any direction, in any direction, for instance, in the 100 direction, 110 direction, or one direction, you actually have to use these C constants. Yes, in, and this is a typical formula here, which allows you to calculate the modulus of um, uh, Young's modulus of a crystal in any direction. And so you have these constants plus an orientation term, which contains the so-called direction cosines of that particular orientation you want to know the uh, Young's modulus of. Hmm? All right. Is there any way in which we can understand the meaning of these C parameters in terms of simple um, deformations, elastic deformations? Yes, you can. Hmm? What, for instance, the meaning of the C1 one parameter is nothing else than the Young's modulus in the Q direction. So if you uh, take your single iron single crystal and you um, you orient it such that the um, one OO type direction are along the X, Y, and Z direction, if I pull uh, on this crystal in the Y direction, so I apply a sigma YY, uh, stress, then the strain is given by the strain is given by strain in the direction is given by s sigma yy divided by c11. So it's it's basically the Young's modulus. C11 is nothing else than the modulus in the 100 direction. What is the meaning of C44? Well, C44 is a is related to the shearing of the uh, the crystal. So if I now shear the crystal, uh, as shown here in the y direction, yes, and the shear plane is the is perpendicular to the, to the z axis here. Then the relation between the um, shear stress, st shear stress and shear strain, is this one here. Hmm? So the shear strain, the shear is equal to the shear stress divided by C44. So both C11 and C44 have a relatively simple um, physical meaning. The um, meaning of, uh, or the, the physical meaning of C12 is a little bit harder to uh, express but it's basically related to the, uh, the, the deformation, the, the following, uh, not, not the C12, but the, the parameter C11 minus C12 divided by two is related to this um, pure shear deformation where you, uh, the, the crystal gets compressed in the y direction and uh, is subject to tension in the z direction. So that deformation is, is uh, controlled by this parameter, slightly more. Right, and we calculate um, these uh, plastic properties, yeah? for instance, along, along any direction. For instance, if HKL, the direction is 100, the modulus is 125, uh, 110 is 210, 111 is 273 gigapascals, okay? If I use um, other data, I find values which are similar, but not exactly the same. So there is some variation in the available um, data. And by the way, this last parameter is the Poisson uh, ratio. But what I want to point your attention to is the fact that in the 100 direction, the modulus, yes, is um, very much, is in less than half the value in the 111 direction. So what does this mean? I have elastic anisotropy. So iron is very elastically, when it comes to elastic deformation, very anisotropic. Hmm? So, um,
this means that um, there are a number of issues here, in particular, what to do if you wish to, on the basis of your knowledge of single crystal elastic behavior, uh, you want to determine what are my elastic properties uh, in a polycrystalline material, well, then you, you have to use some kind of averaging procedures. Hmm? Uh, and there, there are a few available, say, uh, to, to again, to, to uh, uh, repeat the problem is, is if you go measure the elastic modules around one or oh, around 120, 130 gigapascal in modulus in 111, you have 170 to 180 gigapascal, so big difference. So if you want to know, have a good guess at the polycrystalline iron, you can compute the Royce average or the void average, and that gives you values which are around the 200 gigapascal. The geometric average, which uh, averages these two previous values, the square root of the Royce and the void average, is 210 gigapascal. And this is a very close to the experimental value of uh, the uh, Young's modulus for, for iron. So it's rather interesting that um, uh, unless you, uh, you are working with a crystal that's highly uh, textured with uh, one or o directions along uh, the direction which you measure, or one 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 direction along the direction you're measuring, in general, you can safely assume that the um, uh, modulus is 210 uh, gigapascal. So uh, very close to the, the modulus of the one one o direction. Okay. Um, there is a slight difference sometimes reported between the, the modulus of carbon steels and stainless steels. Uh, for the Young's modulus, for the shear modulus also, um, but if you analyze the, uh, the literature data, um, I'm not so sure that this, this, there is this big difference. Um, and again, you have uh, a lot of uh, differences which are basically due to the, the composition of your, your steel. Mm -hmm. So if you want, um, but in, in general uh, the, the, the modulus values of shear and um, uh, Young's modulus are slightly lower for stainless steels than they are for, for, for carbon steels. Mm -hmm. uh, of course once you use a value, a modulus of 210 gigapascal for your steel, you, you automatically have assumed that uh, your material is uh, elastically isotropic, which may not be the case, so that's, that's important to remember. The modulus is, uh, as I said, uh, dependent on the composition and also on the temperature. First, an example of compositional dependence. When we add carbon uh, to uh, steels, what we find is that the modulus tends to decrease. Yes? Okay, whatever the microstructure, microstructural changes are, you get a decrease in the, um, uh, in the modulus. The other thing that's important is the, uh, the modulus change as a function of temperature. So if you uh, measure the modulus of austenitic steels or carbon steels as a function of the temperature, you find that uh, there is a degree of uh, a, a degree of um, a decrease of the modulus as you increase the temperature, and this decrease is of the order of uh, 0.1 gigapascals per degree. So. Uh, it's, it's also uh, a point to remember. Um, I do want to point out the fact that uh, the, um, the modulus of iron is very high. Yeah? Um, so in, comp in comparison, for instance, to aluminum, um, you, you can see that we're, we're talking about the modulus that's three, four times as, as high than the modulus of 
aluminum. Hmm? All right, so, um, so much for the, uh, the modulus of uh, steel. Now let's see uh, what we remember from uh, introductory uh, material science about plastic deformation. So we know that uh, in uh, alpha iron, the slip uh, it occurs on uh, 110 alpha. Now, I'll, as, as we go, I'll, um, I'll have to say uh, something about the slip planes, but let's just assume now that we know that at room temperature, the slip plane is 110 alpha. Uh, and the slip direction in alpha iron is also 111 alpha. Yeah? So, um, so uh, if, if I have, uh, uh, if I make a cut through my crystal here, the, uh, the, the dark gray planes on, on which you slip, and the direction in which they slip is along the diagonal here. And um, if we have a homogeneous slip, the, uh, the, the shear stress, yes, to cause the, uh, uh, the shear, of one planes over one over one another will have this sinusoidal uh, variation, which is which is shown here the mathematical form. Hmm? And um, this uh, you can measure the, the stress. Hmm? Um, you can measure the stress, and if you um, want to uh, have. Uh, a situation where this actually holds, you need to have very small, tiny little iron crystals, which are called whiskers. And these uh, tiny crystals, they have the, the property that there are no or very, very little, hardly any lattice defects, such as dislocations in particular. And if you um, stress uh, applies st uh, stress on these material, what you see is that the, the strain increases. Yes, and there is a, a slight nick in these uh, these stress strain curves. Yes, when you reach the elastic limit, yeah. you see by the way that um, the um, the stress strain curve for the uh, alpha uh, one o direction is lower than for one one one. That's a reflection of the the modular difference, which is much higher for one 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 direction. Uh, and here you have the elastic limit, and you can see that the, uh, the, the stress that's required to get the material the, uh, to slip homogeneously, uh, crystals to plane to slip homogeneously of the order of uh, a, a whopping uh, more than 6,000 uh, megapascal. Hmm? It turns out that um, if you do this experiment and um, you select these crystals, uh, many crystals, and you um, and you now plot the value that you measure here, yes. yes, and you plot this as a function of the size of the whisker. Yes, then you see this tremendous decrease in the 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 strength of this whisker. What, what is happening? Well, as you have larger whiskers, there will be a higher occurrence of dislocations in these whiskers, yes? And the dislocations will make um, the uh, slip of the crystal splits one over the other much more easier than the process of homogeneous slip. Hmm? The, they will allow for slip by dislocation movement. Hmm? And so what you're basically seeing here is that as you go in this direction, the dislocation density, yeah, rho dislocation goes up tremendously and that reduces the, 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 the strength of the material, the yield strength of the material. So um, the theoretical strength of steel, yes, if we use the formula that was on my initial slide is about 12, it's about uh, 12 gigapascals. The whisker crystals can go up to 10 gigapascal. The example I just gave was about six. But polycrystalline iron, 
yes, has about 400. Um, yes, um, this is 10 gigabytes uh, here. Um, sorry, if it's pure iron, it's close to 4 T megapascal. Yes, so this is 40 megapascal. So, in other words, uh, it's a um, thousand. Uh, yeah, 40, 40 uh, megapascal. So, a, if you have polycrystalline alpha iron, the the material is actually very soft. Yes, uh, the reason why the material is so soft is because of the presence of these dislocations, and we've already introduced them. What these dislocations are. So instead of having a uh, the top surface of this crystal moving homogeneously to uh, the left, what we have are dislocations are introduced, and they carry this small amount of shear across the slip plane. Hmm? And I can, in, uh, in this case, for instance, I can calculate what the shear will be uh, caused by this one dislocation moving on plane at the distant h from the uh, the plane that doesn't move. Hmm? Okay? Right. Now, what is it that uh, does cause uh, this small, this minimal, but this, it's very small, uh, stress that's required to get this location to move? Yes? We call this uh, stress the lattice friction. That's the, the stress that's experienced by the dislocations as it moves through the lattice. Hmm? And it's usually referred to as tau P. P for, stands for pyrals. It's the pyrals stress. Hmm? And this pyral stress, or the lattice friction stress, is, uh, is a function of the... Uh, is, is given actually you, there is a theoretical uh, formula for this which is shown here and uh, the parameters are the uh, shear stress the shear uh, modulus the poisson uh, ratio the burgers factor of the dislocation and a factor called w hmm? and w is related directly to the interplanar spacing of the uh, uh, the planes on which slip occurs. Hmm? And uh, so if it's given for um, specific dislocations of edge type by dhkl divided by 1 minus the modulus, and if it's a screw dislocation, it's simply equal to dhkl. So this basically means that slip is favored, i.e. Uh, this uh, pyral stress is lower when I have larger D spacings and smaller burgers vectors. And so that means that you get slip between planes that are far apart, yes, and in directions, yes, um, where, where the, the shear is small. Hmm? And that kind of pretty much defines the, the slip systems we see in, uh, in steels also. A dislocation, if the stress I apply is higher than this pile stress, dislocation will move, they will displace, and, uh, and I will get plastic deformation. And plastic deformation is nothing else than uh, the result of dislocation moving. So, so let's have a look at what I, we mean. And yes, so let's say we have this uh, single crystal, it's iron, and we pull along uh, a 100 direction. Okay, the slip plane in this case is a 110 slip plane, which is indicated here, and we have a dislocation here that's moving on this plane with a a over two one 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 dislocation, uh, Burgess vector, and and that's not the only one, but I'm just going to concentrate on that particular dislocation. Um, so after this dislocation has moved to the crystal and come out on the other side. It will create a step, yes, of dimensions uh, equal to the uh, Burgess factor, the dislocation, and in the case of um, iron, that is 0.25 nanometers, so extremely small step. The relation, but but you you now see that the crystal 
which used to be this high, this would be the, the, the length of the crystal, has now increased, excuse me, uh, yeah, uh, well, the, uh, the length used to be somewhere here, right? And when uh, this has come out, the length has increased. Yes. So uh, I have generated strain, and I can calculate what the strain is. Now, um, this uh, geometry, uh, if you go through it, um, uh, through, go through the math, what you find is that the strain that you realize is half of the Burgess factor times the dislocation times the distance traveled by the dislocations. And the uh, formula has its most uh, best uh, presentation if we focus on the strain rate. Hmm? The strain rate caused by the movement of the dislocations with a velocity v is given by half, one half, b times rho times b, rho being the dislocation density. Hmm? Okay. In um, any material that's undergoing uh, deformation, we see dislocations, definitely in steels. Yeah? This is an example of steels, and uh, you see these long black lines here. This is in a TM micrograph, are uh, basically screw dislocations. And you can see they, they form loops yes, um, in, the, uh, in this thin foil. We know that um, in order to define a dislocation, we need to have um, uh, some formalism. So we usually uh, draw dislocations as um, inverted T's when we're talking about edge dislocations, which means that uh, in this case, we know that the structure of this dislocation looks as if I had formally introduced, inserted extra half plane in the structure, which you show here. And um, I also need to define a line direction, yes, to be able to get the Burgess vector. Yeah. All right. So, a dislocation, I'm not going too much more into details about the dislocation theory, but I think it's important that um, we review a few uh, parameters that are important. First of all, uh, the line tension. The line tension, let, me, let us go straight to the formula for the line tension. The line tension is given by one half the modulus, modulus time the uh, Burgess vector square. Uh, what does this line tension mean? Line tension is the fact, the fact that dislocations have a line tension means that they will always want to minimize their length, yes, if given the opportunity. Yeah. So um, the energy, elastic energy of this dislocation here is smaller than this, uh, the energy of the same dislocation when it is stretched under the influence of a externally applied shear stress. Hmm? So dislocations will always want to limit their, their size, basically, hmm? because uh, increase in dislocations, so, so it basically means that um, the more dislocations you have, the higher, the more elastic energy you have in your um, in your crystals, and as as we already as you already know, uh, dislocation density is a driver force, driving force for for instance processes like recrystallization. Hmm? So, um, uh, dislocations are defined by slip directions, slip planes, of course, also that's definitely connected to the crystallography, as, as uh, said, hmm? because that defines on what planes and in what direction you'll have the, the slip, and hence the, uh, what will be uh, the, uh, the pyral stress. Hmm? Um, and then we, we 
look at edge dislocations and screw dislocations um, when the uh, Burgess vector is perpendicular to the line direction we talk about edge dislocation if they're parallel we talk about screw dislocations the uh, direction of the dislocation uh, movement can be parallel to the Burgess vector or perpendicular to the Burgess vector um, let me show you uh, what we mean. So if we have a, this is a dislocation loop, and this is a Burgess vector. Hmm. It's a Burgess vector. So um, the relationship with line direction and Burgess vector first, the line direction is a vector along this, along the line here, like this one here. So uh, B is a constant along the, uh, line so in this position the in this position here the Burgess vector is perpendicular to the line direction so this is this so this is an edge dislocation in this situation here the line direction is now in this direction right because it, it follows the dislocation loop B and uh, zeta are parallel, so I'm having a screw dislocations. Now, when the dislocation moves, it will typically expand. Yes, right. So the movement of the this of the dislocation is in this direction. So, for edge dislocation, the movement of the dislocation is parallel to B, as you can see. Whereas if for the screw direction, the screw dislocation segment rather, uh, the um, the movement of the dislocation is perpendicular to B. Dislocations can move on glide planes. They can also move to other glide planes. And when they do that, they, uh, the process is called cross-slipping. Uh, it's an important process in steel, cross-slipping, uh, in particular in ferritic steels. Uh, they, uh, they're known to um, cross-slip easily. And the uh, second important thing, um, uh, we can also have um, uh, uh, movement of dislocation from one slip lane to another slip lane in a non-conservative way. And that, that happens when um, dislocations pick up point defects, typically vacancies. They can move up, their, their glide plane can move up or down. Um, depending on, on their uh, geometry. Hmm? The, uh, we will not talk about uh, non-conservative, so-called non-conservative climb, uh, because that would take us into the realm of creep, etc. But we'll, we will definitely come back to cross-slip and how it affects the properties of ferritic steels. And uh, we will, um, what, what's important to know at this stage is that cross-slip is, is very common uh, or is essentially uh, uh, a phenomenon that only occurs on screw dislocation segments. Hmm? Screw dislocations, very important in BCC iron. Hmm? In um, alpha iron and in many ferritic steels, uh, it has now been more or less established that uh, certainly at lower temperatures. Dislocations move uh, via a mechanism that's called double kink nucleation mechanism. And uh, it's in particular important, of particular importance for the screw dislocation segments. Let's look at what this process means. So we're looking down on a plane here, which is a 110 plane, excuse me. So we're looking down on that plane. And uh, we look at a screw dislocation segment in that plane. Uh, this screw dislocation segment uh, has uh, the, the property that it's parallel to one, one, one direction, yes? And um, it lies in a what we call a Pyrrhal's valley. That means that this uh, screw dislocation, when, when it moves around, it goes through a 
it experiences a periodic potential barrier to its motion. Yes? And the way it crosses, it moves into the glide plane is not by jumping from one pyrals value to the next, but by developing kink pairs. So the uh, a very short piece of the dislocation, for instance this piece here, makes a jump over the uh, from one parallel value to the next parallel value, and it creates kinks. Yes, and these kinks can move very quickly. And so, and they move laterally; they move away from each other. Yes, and when they reach the end of the uh, dislocation, basically the dislocation is moved from this parallel value to the next parallel value. In other words, it, the dislocation has undergone an elementary glide step. Hmm? So. The dislocation motion from one pyrus value to the next is due to kink formation and kink migration. Hmm? These kinks uh, are, are, uh, are uh, formed, uh, can be really formed by um, if the temperature is high uh, by thermal activation, but usually, uh, certainly at lower temperature, you need both thermal activation and an applied stress. Okay? Right. So. Um, up to now, we've been talking about um, single crystals. Hmm? Um, our crystal will be uh, a grain in the steel, hmm? and so when, when you apply force to a steel, you have in the grain, the, that single crystal grain, you will have dislocation loops yes? that will be uh, subject to shear stresses. Yeah? And these shear stresses will make, for instance, in this case, this loop will expand, yes, and uh, generate uh, strain, the deformation of that grain. You can calculate the force that works on all these uh, segments and determine uh, in what direction the, the loop forms. And, and this is well known. Uh, this is the this, this equation, which is known as the uh, peach curl equation. So you can determine. Um, the um, what happens to dislocations, individual dislocations or dislocation loops and uh, deform the material. Hmm? So um, let's now go into details uh, of the geometry of slip in uh, ferritic uh, alpha iron and ferritic low carbon steels. The, uh, there are two slip planes in principle. That's the 110 slip plane and the slip is then in the 111 direction or in um, other uh, another uh, slip plane and that's the 112 yes and this 112 and the 110 direction have one uh, direction in common which is the slip direction the uh, 112 slip direction um, and uh, so they both observed in the uh, in the BCCR there are some textbooks that also talk about one, two, three, uh, but in general, you know, when it comes to steel, um, it, it's important to uh, know that you, those are the two main slip systems. And in fact, when it comes to steels, uh, this is the this is the slip plane. Hmm? For iron, uh, the situation is a bit more complex, but um, slip in the in steels. Because cross slip is so prominent, yes, and uh, on the macroscopic, microscopically spoken, the slip doesn't look, uh, doesn't always look very crystallographic, hmm? although it is. Yeah, and the reason is because we get a phenomenon called pencil glide. Hmm? So, what is pencil glide? So, if if you take um, pencils, yes, put them together. Yes, like like I did here, uh, you you know you can you can shift the pencil with respect to each other. The direction of your shift is is uh, very very well defined. It's along the, the pencil glide. So that would be, for instance, in case of BCC iron, would be the the one on one direction. However, if you look at the the slip plane that you create, it can be very very uh, ill defined. Yes. Even though it's it is the same 
phase of the pencils that, that shift with respect one with respect to the other. So microscopically, unless look uh, exactly uh, on the slip direction, yes, you the uh, slip uh, planes that you will see will be uh, will not be very well crystallographic, well defined on the microscopic scale. So uh, pencil glide is very characteristic of um, of uh, ferritic steels and alpha iron, um, and, and it basically means you have a, a direction of slip is well defined, and you give a straight slip line only when you view the um, you, your uh, angle of view is such that you look perpendicular to the direction of slip. But if you look at the slip plane itself in any particular direction, it it the slip plane looks very wavy. Hmm? This wavy slip which is the result of cross-slip, is something very characteristic for, um, uh, for alpha iron, uh, iron alloys, and, and, and ferritic steels. So what, what happens in this um, cross-slip? Well, this is a dislocation loop here, yes? And the segments here and here are parallel to the Burgess factor, so they're screw dislocations. These screw dislocations can move by cross-slip, process from one slip plane to another slip plane, yes? And when they do this, yes, the, the slip plane, yes, changes, yes? And uh, the screw dislocation alpha iron do this apparently very frequently. Hmm? So the slip plane, even though it's well defined on the macroscopic scale, it, it's uh, not clearly visible that it's a 110 slip plane on which the dislocations slip. Hmm? Good. So um, what uh, do we know about uh, uh, alpha iron? Plastic deformation is generated by dislocation movement, which we refer to as dislocation slip. And um, most of the time, uh, certainly when it comes to steel, the slip plane is 110 and the direction of the slip is uh, 111. In addition, a dislocation loop, the screw segments in the dislocation loops will have uh, very, will very easily cross-slip. If you uh, look at slip uh, of dislocations, one of the things you, you want to know, you, you can of course measure the, uh, the pyral stress, um, or calculate it uh, with the formula I just um, uh, we discussed a few slides ago, or you can do experimental measurement of the um, uh, stress or shear stress needed to have the dislocation move, and that, as you know, is done by um, taking a single crystal, yeah. having a force acting on it, yes knowing what glide plane the glide will be on and in what direction the slip will be. And then you can calculate using the, this, the formula that's shown here, yes, you, uh, which is a Schmidt formula. You can calculate what the, uh, the stress is at which uh, the, re the so-called resolve stress is at which the, um, the crystal started to uh, flow. And there are a number of interesting things that happen when you do this. Hmm? Uh, first of all, let's have a look at what this stress is. Hmm? So how much, uh, what is the shear stress in the direction of the Burgess factor that I need to apply on a 011 plane to get this location to move at room temperature in alpha iron? Well, this is shown here. That is the, for an angle zero, this point here. And I find a value that is close to 20 megapascal. Now, that is the, the shear uh, stress. If I need to calculate what was the tensile stress to apply uh, for that, I need to double this value. Yes? So that will get me to a little bit below 40 megapascal here. So it basically means that alpha iron, yes, at room temperature, has a strength of 40 
mega plasma. That's very low value. Yes, that e very easy for you would be very easy for any one of you to to deform a single crystal. Uh, we do know, however, that um, that steels are used in applications which require a gigapascal or more in strength. So there will be a considerable um, effort in, um, in 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 steel development aimed at increasing this. Um, uh, the strength, yield strength in, in this case, uh, to much higher levels. Okay, and that we will discuss this in, in more detail. But there are a number of um, uh, other uh, important things uh, which make uh, iron um, uh, interesting. Is that um, the um, uh, mechanical properties of the, of the single crystals are not uh, perfectly symmetric, if I may explain this. And the Sm Schmidt law is not perfectly uh, applicable to, uh, to iron. In particular, uh, what uh, people have found out is that when you uh, uh, do this experiment that where you compress a crystal, yes, uh, according to Schmidt, the only forces that are of important are the shear, shear forces and shear stresses in the direction of the slip. It turns out that the normal forces, normal on the slip, are also important in the case of iron. Hmm? And this adds a uh, complication. Hmm? So now, um, I, we won't go into this. Um, next uh, semester, I teach a, um, a course on purely the mechanics of uh, iron and steel, and, and there we'll, we'll, we'll go into some more detail uh, about this. But um, so, if you uh, do single crystal measurements, as I said, uh, this is what you get. You get typically slightly below a 20 megapascal of. Uh, 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 shear strength, yes, hmm. um, of um, yeah of, um, of of uh, critical shear strength, yes, uh, which goes to thirty to forty in yield strength, hmm. double that value. The um, if you have carbon in solid solution, you get effects of solid solution strength, and it's very very pronounced for for carbon very strong increase. So um, the very often the, the differences that you get in uh, measurements of uh, conflicting reports of uh, shear stress uh, measurements in steels are the result of the fact that the, the, the chemistry of the, the materials that are tested are different. All right. So what about these um, uh, slip planes, the 112 slip planes? Okay. Iron, veritic iron, alpha iron, yes, has this peculiarity that as you say measure the yield strength, and you measure this yield strength at different temperatures, you find that uh, the yield strength is not very temperature dependent until you come to a, uh, a temperature range that's close to room temperature. And there what you see is you get a steep increase in the yield strength, very steep, yes. All right. What you also observe is that slip changes. Slip plane can change. At low temperatures, 112, slip planes becomes more dominant. At higher temperature, in steels in particular, room temperatures, we get slip on 110 planes. The loops, the dislocation loops, have also a different geometry. At lower temperature, you tend to have very elongated loops. Whereas at higher temperature, the loops are more rounded. 
What does this mean when the loops are elongated like this? It means that the screw dislocation segments have become, are becoming very long. Yes? And what is happening? Well, what is happening is very simple. At low temperatures, the mobility of the screw dislocation segments yes, drops dramatically. The reason is because the screw dislocation segments being parallel to 110 directions lie in the Pyrrhals valleys and it becomes at lower temperature increasingly difficult for these screw dislocation segments to jump from one Pyrrhals valley to the other one. Hmm? The kink formation is, uh, double kink formation is not so efficient. And why is this that uh, the, uh, this dislocation does that? Why is it that if it lies perfectly along a 111 direction, why do I have this uh, difficulty in moving this location or creating double case? This is the reason. The reason is that the screw dislocations have a core that is three-dimensional. So the core is split in three dimensions, yes, and it's split into three different 101, excuse me, yeah, 101 or 101 uh, type planes. Hmm? When it does this, uh, the dislocation locks, as it were, into a position parallel to the 11 uh, direction, and its velocity, its uh, ability to move under the influence of stress is very greatly diminished because before it can move <coughs> uh, away from a position like this, it will have to. Uh, the, 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 the core structure of the screw will have to uh, be rearranged. Hmm? So the spread of the core leads to very high lattice friction stress for screw dislocations hmm? because it, you, you need to have these dislocations recombine before you can, you can move this location. And this is very important. This does not happen in gamma iron or in austenitic steels. Okay. There are uh, many things we can tell about uh, dislocation velocities. So we already said one is in the case of BCC iron, our screw dislocation segments have a very high um, uh, experience, a very high pyral stress because their, their core structure uh, changes. Um, the um, Dislocation velocity hmm, is therefore uh, temperature dependent. It is also uh, dependent a function of stress. Hmm. And um, so if you measure dislocation velocities as a function of stress, yes, what you find is this law. Hmm. The velocity of the dislocation di divided by a reference velocity, which is usually one meters per second uh, is uh, equal to the ratio of the shear stress on the dislocation divided by a reference shear stress to get this one uh, meter per centimeter per second, uh, excuse me, uh, velocity to the power n. Okay. Um, so, and, and, and here you, you see uh, some measurements and you, you can see also that the, the temperature dependence, hmm, for instance, if I'm at, uh, I have a stress of, say, 20 megapascal, yes, at 77 degrees C, uh, my dislocation velocity is 10 to the minus 6 centimeters per second. At room temperature, it will be close to uh, 10 to the minus 2 uh, centimeters per second. So the temperature... Uh, uh, so, and that's what is basically having this thermal activation of a part of the slip contributing to the easier easier uh, motion of the dislocation. So this um, uh, um, exponent is called the, the stress exponent and is of course related to the slope of this um, um, 
line here of dislocation velocity, shear stress. And we also have temperature dependence. Now, this parameter can be uh, small or large. It tends to be uh, small, so it's small uh, for alpha iron, yes, alpha iron, and it's large, and it is large for gamma iron. And that has a very, we'll see a later stage, that that has an impact on the occurrence of uh, localized deformations in steels. In particular, well, we'll, we'll see it now, uh, the, the slide is, is here. So in uh, uh, ferritic steels and in um, uh, low carbon steels, things like this, we often see a yield point Yes, and a yield drop, and that is due not this very often um, the suggestion that uh, this yield drop may be due to the, um, uh, the necessarily due to the presence of carbon locking dislocation, etc. Um, it's that is an important aspect because the, when you lock dislocation with carbon atoms you create a starting situation where you have an extremely low uh, dis mobile dislocation density. But uh, what is equally important is that this uh, stress exponent be low. Hmm? That, and that the um, um, changes in the, in the stress don't give large changes in the dislocation uh, velocity at least in comparison to austenite. In austenitic steels, the, uh, the stress exponent is 200, yes? So small, if I may, small differences in the, the stress will translate in large uh, differences in the velocity. All right, so, so important uh, distinction here uh, between ferrite and, and austenite, okay? Uh, you can calculate this, hmm? that um, the, uh, for instance, what happens to, uh, if you change the, uh, the stress exponent in a theoretical model from 35 to 200, you can see that this yield drop, yes, is almost uh, fully uh, gone, yeah? Okay. So, um, at this stage, uh, I think it uh, would be good if we uh, stopped, and then we, uh, um, when we reconvene, we will uh, start with uh, highlighting the, uh, the properties, uh, deformation properties, and uh, crystallography of deformation, in uh, particular in uh, austenitic uh, steels. Thank you very much for your, uh, your attention.